Welcome to today's teaching. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm going to be carrying on dealing with the subject of Israel and the war that's going on in Israel at the, at the present moment. And also we're heading towards all the indications of the end times. I want to look at the sign of the land, which was what we had looked at. And there are four specific things that I want to consider. The first one is this. These are the keys regarding the return of Jesus as king. It requires this. Firstly, that Israel become a nation again. Secondly, that Jerusalem be in Jewish hands and under Jewish control. Thirdly, the nations begin to unite against Israel. And fourthly, that Jerusalem becomes a cup that sends all the nations reeling. In other words, it's something that becomes an issue to every nation. The fact of Jerusalem, whether it, just the fact that Jeru Jerusalem exists and that she's under the control of at least half of Jerusalem is totally under the control of Jewish people. Now, we cannot even begin to consider that the end times are upon us unless those four signs are present. And I want, I've just been thinking about this a lot in the last little while, especially since the war began, but I've thought about it over the last couple of years, because one of the things that I really despise is a doctrine that's called replacement theology. And I, I know that I've spoken about this at different times, but I want to just touch on it again here very briefly. And that is that when Israel was destroyed and the Jews were really pushed out of the land, although there's always been a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. But after the Romans burned the city down and in, 80, and in um, AD 85 expelled them from, from Jerusalem, there was, that was the time at which they called uh, the land of Israel, Philist uh, Palestine, as a derivative of Philistine. And the very interesting thing about the Philistines, not only were they the, the sort of the most feared of Israel's enemies and the most present, ever present of Israel's enemies, but the land that they lived in is what we know now as the Gaza Strip. That was where their habitation was. So they, because they were the, like the main enemies of Israel, as an insult to the Jews, they called the Roman, the Roman emperor called the land of Israel no longer Israel, but called it Palestine. You know, they could have gone back to the original name, which was, which was Canaan, many years before when God gave them the land. He said, I'm going to drive out the Canaanites and I'm going to give you this land. And they had to go in and fight for it. And in Joshua, we find that they had to defeat 31 kings and they took over the land because it was something that had been given by God. And, you know, you can have a problem with that. But I, I just don't suggest that anybody argue with God because he is God and all the nations are his and he can do exactly what he likes with any of them. And he said to Israel, I haven't chosen you because you're better than anybody else. He said, I loved your fathers, which were Isaac, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he said, I'm giving it to you, even though you're not as big as other nations, because you're one of the smallest. And he said, but I'm doing this for the sake of your forefathers and for the sake of my name. And so that was why he gave the land of Canaan to the nation of Israel. And they had to go in and they had to fight for it and occupy that which God had given. So we see that that was their land. So if the Romans had wanted to call it anything, they could have gone back and called it the land of Canaan. But there was a distinct desire to actually insult the Jews because the Jews had been a thorn in their flesh. And that's where the name Palestine comes from. So from 85 AD through all the, the millennia, the two millennia, which is a thousand years, is a millennium. So through two millennia, 2,000 years, when people read the Bible and a lot of the Bible, something that I, I preached at um, Belito, Church Alive, one of my favorite churches, and I preached there on this past Sunday. And one of the things that Mark Rogers, who is their pastor, one of the things he did was he picked up his Bible and he said, this part here, this big part is all about Israel. This here is the New Testament. 
and that is for Christians. And you know that even here, part of the New Testament is the letter that was written to the Hebrew Christians, and also part of Revelation and throughout three chapters in Romans are all devoted to Israel. So you cannot read the Bible without knowing that the key to everything is Israel. But in those, in these 2000 years from the time Israel ceased to exist as a nation up until the present time, there was no Israel. And so people had no idea what to do with it. Like we read about Israel, but there isn't an Israel. When we look on the map, there's no Israel. Um, Israel sort of ended. So what do we do? And they came up with a, with a doctrine called replacement theology. Uh, and all that means is that God is finished with Israel and he's replaced Israel with the church. And so every time you read Israel in the, in the word of God, you replace it with the church, which actually makes no sense. Because there are places in the word where if you try to put the church in, in place of Israel, it makes no sense whatsoever. However, they honestly didn't know what to do with the whole question of Israel. And yet throughout these years, there's always been a remnant, which is a small group of people who've had an intense belief in what the Bible says. And they had read some of the scriptures I'm going to give you in a little bit. And these scriptures speak about how God is going to restore the people to the land. After a long time, he's going to bring them back. It says from the four quarters of the earth, not corners, a sphere doesn't have corners, but it can be cut like an orange into quarters. So he's going to bring them back from the, the four quarters of the earth. And he's going to bring them back to their own land. We're going to read these scriptures. And those are so direct. And they're things that have happened. They are prophecies that have been fulfilled. Um, and so even people who had believed in replacement theology up until 1948, when Israel became a nation again on the, on the 14th or 15th of May, um, it's, they, they celebrated on the 14th of May. And so anybody who had been believing in replacement theology needed to readjust their thinking and their theology at that point in time. Because although there had been no Israel for 2,000 years, there was an Israel again. And yet that theology is something that persists and it continues in many, many denominations where the people up until this point are not pro-Israel. They are pro-Palestinians, and I'm sad to say this, and I really pray it doesn't sound arrogant, but it is, this is just complete ignorance. Um, I'm somebody who has studied on Israel extensively and have a whole library of things on Israel and the land and the history of the land and taught on it for a year in his church in 2000, and then in 2010, um, I really felt the need to begin to teach on Islam as well. So I did another year of teaching on Israel and Islam and have gone into the history of what happened to the land and what happened when Israel was restored. And um, I'm just going to say this for you to take hold of and think about. At the time that Israel became, well, rather, at the time that the Zionist movement began, which was in the 1800s, God put it in the hearts of Jews in different parts of the world to long for a homeland again. And they longed to go back to actually the land of their forefathers. And they began to move back, leaving the comforts of whatever town or city or country they lived in. And they began to move back. This was before the First World War. So they moved back again and they were going back as pioneers because the land at that time was a land that was absolutely barren and absolutely uninhabited. They, um, Mark Twain, who is a great, uh, one of the great American authors who wrote Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, he went on a trip to the Middle East. And when he wrote about Israel, he wrote about, or, you know, the land that was called Palestine. He said, when you go through, he said, I travel through Palestine and he I, he didn't use the word God forsaken. I can't remember the exact quotes, but he might as well have said God forsaken. He said it's barren, it's uninhabited, it's like a wasteland. And he said, all I saw were a few wild camels. And I think he mentioned a couple of Bedouin. 
you know, the nomadic tribes that lived there or would pass through the land. But he spoke about how, what an absolute waste of, of space the country was and just how he was glad to get out of it. And so that was the condition of the land. And the people who went back to the land that they were longing for, their own homeland, had to begin with this wasteland. They had to begin to farm it, cultivate it, plant trees because there were no trees. And now when you go to Israel, there are forests. But in all of this, it began to stir within them that God wanted them to go back there. One of the men, a man named Theodore Herzl, began to, he collected Hebrew, the Hebrew language, and put it into 600 encyclopedias or dictionaries. And he actually brought a language that was virtually dead. He brought it back to life. And now in Israel, everybody speaks Hebrew. And so this is just the whole thing around this is just one miracle after another. And so the people who believed in in replacement theology needed to readjust their thinking at this time and go, no, you know what? Um, I understand now that all the prophecies that God gave uh, have been, are being fulfilled. I want to look at 2 Peter 3, 9, and it says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And for those of you, by the way, who believe that there are, that some have only been created for salvation, let me just remind you that it says here, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, not just a few people. And then in Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And again, reading those things way back when, or in the Middle Ages, or in the first few centuries after Jesus had been born, how on earth was that possible? For the knowledge of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But we are living in a time and an age where that very thing has happened. It's in front of us. And I believe that the great rise in technology, although it's been used for evil purposes, has been used by God to get the gospel out all over the world. And again, that's a miracle, the technology that we're living with. Um, I'm looking at my cell phone right now because that's where I have my notes. And these, these, incidentally, if you're anti-Israel and you want to boycott her, please get rid of your cell phone because it's Israeli technology in here. Don't have your cancer treatment anymore. Just get rid of most of the medicines you know because most of what we have that is beneficial to mankind has come from Israel. But anyway, I've got my notes on on my iPhone. And... As we, as we see global air travel, we see satellite TV going everywhere, even to the islands of the, of, and the furthest parts of the world. We also know that there were movies like the Jesus movie, which has been shown at the back of, like in the outback in Australia and right up in Central Africa and to the sand people in the Kalahari Desert and wherever you find uh, people, and it's in the Amazon. And that Jesus movie has been shown out in, in the open air and sometimes they've had to use almost like a, um, a, a, like a, a projector where they, they wind it by hand or they bring in a generator so that it can work. But there, there are more people who have been reached with the gospel through the Jesus movie than through any other, through more than through Billy Graham's preaching or any of the great evangelists, more than their preaching. It's reached more people than Alpha has reached. And Alpha has reached multiplied hundreds of millions of people. So whatever it is, all the gospel has gone out in various ways. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so that is something that we know. And Matthew had said it. He said this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the earth. And he said, that is, and then the end will come. And so all these things are happening, but they couldn't have happened until Israel became a nation again. And so I just want to give you 
um, one of the scriptures that I promised, Isaiah 11, 11 to 12. And that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, which is Ethiopia, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the, na- for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Isaiah 27, 6. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. And it's interesting to me here that fruit from Israel does go all over the world, even though it's a tiny little nation. But also the fact is he uses the word Jacob, which was what he was called before God gave him the name Israel. But Isaac and Ishmael were brothers. And God gave the land to Isaac, not to Ishmael. And the Jewish people came from the land of of Jacob, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Isaiah prophesied, in days to come, Jacob will take root, which is the nation of Israel. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Jeremiah 23, 7 and 8. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. And Amos 9 verses 14 and 15, he says, I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And then Isaiah 43, 5 to 7. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons and from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And then finally, Isaiah forty nine twenty two. And by the way, these are just some of the scriptures. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. And so that is what the Word of God says. That's what God predicted or prophesied. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And he's done it. And this, this happens as we head toward the end times. And... Just a final thought, because I've completely run out of time. A final thought is this. When you see a clock and you see the minute hand going round, you can sometimes get to a point where you're watching the second hand go. And I feel that we're at a time when we're not even watching the minute hand anymore because the seconds are being ticked off. See you next week. God bless you. (music) 